Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for coming. My name is uh, Gregor Bayerle. I'm a software product specialist for Personas. And next to me is Jamie. I'm a Fender product manager, and I look after Squire and Acoustics for Fender. Um, my name's Jamie, and thanks for having us, guys. Great. And we're going to do this workshop together and really looking forward to it. So we have completely different backgrounds, which is kind of interesting, right? You are mostly an instrumentalist. Yeah, so in regards to, I'm a new person to recording. I have got this software for the first time last week. I got my first interface last week as well. Uh, so on Sunday, I attempted my first recording ever using Studio One. Um, so it, today for me is about my experience sharing with you how easy I found it to actually make a recording. Um, I also I primarily, we'll talk about this a bit later, but primarily used this one guitar for the entire recording and a few plugins. So we'll talk through how that worked. But, um, so we'll talk through that a little bit later. And Jamie, maybe it was so easy for you because you play the guitar really well. Like, I can't play any instrument well. i just uh, the guy for the music software. But uh, I think that's, um, that's something uh, that harmonizes quite well with each other. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm good in the software, you're good at the instrument. Yeah, as I said, I've recorded before, but never been the guy pushing any buttons. Yeah, that's so me. Just been, yeah, so. Right, so why don't we start off, like, at square one, where I just show you the very basics um, and uh, show you what a music software is and what we want to use it for when it comes to riff to release, right? Like the first song idea and how to export that as an MP3 or WAV file ultimately. So what has happened so far is I literally just clicked on the Studio One application here in my dock on Mac OS, right? And this is what opens up and um, uh, this is important for me to emphasize because often people feel like uh, that I already left out the first step. Like, how did you get there, right? Like, um, uh, but this is literally everything that has happened so far. I only opened up the application. And an easy way to start would be simply clicking new, which allows me to open a completely empty song, which looks like this, completely new song. And I want to show you what makes Studio One a bit more intuitive than most softwares, in my opinion, and that is the core principle of dragging and dropping. So 90% of the entire software can be controlled by simply like left-clicking, holding, and dragging somewhere. And the behavior that you would expect is actually what's going to happen. So for example, I have the browser here on the right. And let's say I want to record guitar with an effect, right? Like, for example, like a pedal or maybe an amp, something like that. I literally just go to effects and I drag the amp into my song, like that. And this has already created the track that I need to record my guitar automatically. So I don't have to worry about all of these steps because all of these steps are already included in this one drag and drop motion. Right. So in most DAWs, just to show you how this would usually go, you would have to click on Add Track. And then you would say, like, OK, it's an audio track, I guess. I guess I call this guitar. What format is this? I don't know. right? And you would already be kind of confused and out of it. I literally just want to do this. Right? And that's kind of what makes Studio One uh, pretty unique. It's the same thing if you're like an EDM or DJ producer and you're working with virtual instruments. It would be the exact same thing. In that case, you would simply go to the instrument section of the browser and you would drag in your drum pad or you would drag in your bass and you could start playing that right away. Okay, So just a little bit about the core philosophy of this software. Um, now, when I select the Empire, which is the guitar amp simulation that we have inside of Studio One, which works obviously great also with the uh, guitars like the Acoustasonic. We now have an audio track here. And this audio track is basically our interface between the real instrument and the laptop, right? We want to try to record the real instrument into the laptop, and we can do that through this audio track. But in order to be able to do that, we need to tell Studio One where the audio is coming from. Right? And that's where these interfaces come in. So we unfortunately can't plug in the guitar 
directly into a laptop, right? It just doesn't work, right? It's, there's, no, there's no input like that on the laptop. So we need an interface that provides these connections that the laptop is missing, right? And so with this, we can connect the guitar onto the input at the front, and that goes from a USB-C cable to the laptop. So it's like the interface between the instrument and the laptop and the music software inside. And once we've connected that, we can then tell the software where our instrument is, right? So for example, guitar, that guitar is plugged into input one, right? So literally just enter guitar, input one, and that's all we need to do. And now I can actually go ahead and record that if I wanted to. That's what the red button is for. On every track, you're going to find this so-called record arm button. This enables the uh, input on the interface, and now you would be ready to record into your laptop. And next to it, you have a monitor button, which actually allows you to audition that at the same time. Right? So they, they are not necessarily the same. Um, often you want to use them together, but they do different things. This is for recording, so that when I now hit record, something is happening on this timeline, right? Right, that's controlled through this button. And the monitor button next to it allows you to hear what you're actually doing. Okay, so that would be the monitor and the monitor function that you find on every track. And that's pretty much it. This is pretty much all you need to know about the, the um, fundamentals of a music software. There's not much more to know because from this point forward, you're literally just adding tracks, you're recording tracks, you're uh, compiling tracks, uh, stacking them onto each other, uh, adding some drums maybe, and uh, at some point you find something that actually resembles a song. Right? And uh, maybe we can already take a look at uh, what you've done, Jamie, if you want to. Yeah, let's have a look at the song that I created. As I said, I did it last week. First time. Uh, should we have a listen? Yeah, sure. Apologies in advance if you don't like it, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they're going to love it. <laughs>
certainly better than what I recorded in my first attempt with Studio One. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. That's, uh, cheers, guys. So as I said, that was my my first go at doing that, and it, it was I can't say how easy it was to use. It was a real. So now I've discovered this. I'm going to be going into. This is me now. I'm going to be doing loads of recording at home now. <laughs> uh, it's it was really really good fun doing this, and uh, something I will definitely pursue. But. I'll kind of talk you through uh, my, the process of how I did it. I only really used three instruments, I suppose. I used a bass guitar, which I use my uh, Squire 70s P bass. Um, and I used the Acoustasonic. Uh, and the Acoustasonic that I used was this particular one here. Um, this is the Mexican. Has anyone had a, played Acoustasonics yet? Have you all had a, had a look and had a go? Do you know what an Acoustasonic is? Do you know is? what an Acoustasonic is and what it does? Um, so basically, I, I use this because I think these are the most versatile instruments that we do. They, we, these things do everything. Um, it's, essentially, it's an acoustic guitar at heart. So in regards to build, we've got a spruce top, we've got a mahogany back and a mahogany neck, and we have a rosewood fingerboard. This is one of our Mexican models. This is the player Telecaster. Behind us, we have some more examples. I, we started, this launched originally in 2019 with an American version. Uh, there's one over there in mahogany with a mahogany top. Um, and essentially, the idea behind these guitars is they are kind of, they will do everything you need in a live situation or a recording situation. So essentially, the guitar models different acoustic guitars. So this particular one, you have three different settings. This one, this setting at the back here, this is acoustic guitar, which is using the under saddle pickup. There's some DSP in there, some digital stuff going on to create those sounds. But what it'll do, it'll it'll go from. Uh, <laughs> okay, I can hold it up for you if you want. <laughs> it, it will go from um, a small-bodied acoustic, and if you turn this particular knob here, they'll take you through a, to a full-bodied uh, dreadnought rosewood back and sides. And should I plug it in? Yeah, maybe we can show them immediately how you could plug that in. Yeah. And um, this would be a great opportunity, actually, to show how we get this into our computer to begin with, right? Because this is already like a finished session, and people might wonder, yeah. how did you record these sounds to begin with? So maybe we run through that process together. So, like I said, um, you could just take the Empire, like I showed you in the beginning, and drag that in. And assign that to the input where um, you currently have the guitar assigned, right? So I showed you that before. Guitar is in input one, right? Like this. Okay. And then I can assign the track to guitar, input one. And of course, I have an amp now, so I can just disable that. And now we can hear the guitar inside of our software. And what's really cool is we were able to gain stage this automatically. We did that earlier by simply selecting the input and then pressing auto gain on our interface. And then Jamie just played. And the interface set the correct gain for us automatically. So we didn't have to know that. It just happened automatically as he's playing. See, now it's green. It has gain staged it completely by itself. So we can't even mess up that part, which is kind of nice. And now you can actually show um, yeah, what you wanted to show. Let me hold up the microphone for you again. <laughs> we've got, so basically, this guitar, we've got three different selector switches, and there's three different voices. Um, the first here is the acoustic setting. So we've got two acoustic guitars. We've got. So there we have a, a rosewood back and side dreadnought, and as you blend in the other side, we get a smaller bodied parlor guitar. So, and you can blend between the two. So it's really versatile in getting what particular sound you want. With the American models, there's a five way selector switch, and you get a lot more uh, acoustic models in there as well. Okay, but this is the Mexican model. Uh, obviously, it's cheaper. Slightly difference between the Mexican and the U.S. model is this has got a rosewood. Um, obviously, they're made in Mexico, made in U.S. Rosewood neck. That's ebony. We've got ebony bridge on the U.S. and we've got a USB plug-in for battery. This one has got a a nine volt battery. 
Uh, with the USB, you usually get about 20 hours, so there's plenty of time, and there's a light to let you know if you're running out of battery. So if you're in a gig situation, you're like, oh, no, here we go. So you, you should know beforehand. Um, other settings on this. So for this particular one, we go then go to the lo-fi setting. This is activating the under-saddle bridge, under-saddle uh, pickup. And it's, oh, yeah. So it's more lo-fi. It's a direct kind of piezo style. Again, you can blend between the two. So again, other options. And then finally, we get to electric guitar. So this is basically, you've got a clean electric to a, to a more boosted, dirty electric. Um, essentially, think of a Telecaster through a deluxe reverb or something like that. Uh, just a really great, versatile guitar. Yeah, so thank you. Right. That's the guitar that I used for this. Um, I also used, I found my daughter's little MIDI keyboard and plugged that in and uh, managed to get some MIDI sounds from using this as well. So we can run through that. But should we have a quick look through um, each yeah. track? Hang a bit. Maybe just one more thing I want to I wanna emphasize is that now that we have this guitar inside of the software, we also have the digital playground that's completely open to us now. So for example, if you want to add some reverb to this guitar, it would be as easy as just dragging any of the reverb plugins that we have inside of Studio One and drag that onto the track by simply, again with this drag and drop, say, I want to have that reverb on that track. So just move it on there. And if you would now play, maybe you can play it just one more time, you would actually hear a guitar with reverb now. You can already hear it. Right. So just to show you that from this point forward, you can combine all of the analog capabilities you get with the instrument with all of the digital plugins that are available in Sound Studio One. Right, so maybe we can uh, talk through the tracks and yeah. just get an idea of what you did. OK, so um, I started off, the click track was really easy to set up. I set up my BPM, my beats per minute. Um, right. You want to show how, do, how, how did you did do that? that? I just I, I saw the metronome. This is this is how I went, and I was I saw the metronome yeah. and I clicked it, and all of a sudden I had a click, and yeah. that, that that was how simple it was. That's one of my favorite features about Studio One that you can actually just tap the tempo with the mouse. Like if I say I want to have something like da da da, da. it's just clicking four times, and it actually adjusted the BPM to 106 now. Now I'm just going to undo that so it's back to the original tempo. But it's pretty cool that you can do this. And you can also assign tap tempo to any MIDI controller or anything like that. And then you could tap this, would be the same functionality. But it is really easy to set the click indeed. And also when you click on this wrench icon here, then you can even select your own sounds. can even be your own samples that you can use for a metronome. So you can completely customize the metronome to your liking. So that was probably pretty easy to set up, right? Yeah, super yeah. easy to set up. There was also, when I first started, there was no pre-count, and then I just clicked in and yeah. pre-count. And you can choose one. how many bars you want to, mm. to be, before, before the, record, the red light goes on, essentially. Yeah, um, you can tell it here. OK, so the first track I did, the top one, is um, I used my, the Acoustic Sonic Telecaster uh, on the clean setting, and I used... Basically, I had a reverb pedal, and I just turned the mix up full. Mm. So it's just reverb. So reverb, just the mix of the guitar. Maybe we can the listen to that. So this is a guitar making this noise. Oh, that's a guitar. Yeah, that's a guitar. Wow. So I just took away the attack and had a, ah. the reverb coming. That's just the reverb trail. Very nice. And I just played the chords, so I had a, be a nice bed for underneath. And that goes through the whole track. Yeah, super nice. Gives like this ambient layer. Ambient yeah, layer, yeah. yeah. Beautiful. I kind of I had in mind on this kind of a Noel Gallagher type thing when I was doing it. So um, obviously, it's a song that would have singing on it at some point. So um, okay, yeah. So and the second track I, I did, I did two. I recorded two acoustic guitars. Mm -hmm. uh, the first I used, I believe, I used the Parlor. Um, that's the second one, I think. The part, okay, the first one I used the Rosewood Dreadnought yes. from the Acoustic Sonic. That's the Rosewood. And you have a bit of reverb on there. I had some reverb, I added some reverb. And I believe I put some compression on it as well. Yeah, before, like after the reverb actually, oh. which is an interesting decision. I, I didn't, 
being new, I didn't know that was. Oh, the you, wrong can decision. you can absolutely, you can absolutely do this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so I did that, and I think I believe I panned it to the either the left or the right. Uh, yeah, this yeah. one you panned to the left, and the other one to the right. So we had a spread of two acoustic guitars, which is quite nice. Yeah. So this is the uh, the parlor, and if you hear them together, it makes it for a nice stereo. It is actually really important. Uh, often people try to just duplicate the same track and yeah. hard pan it to the left and to the right, yeah. but then it's just the same thing to the left and to the right. And they try to offset it a little bit to create a stereo, but all they do is create phase issues. And when you hear that on one of these one-way Bluetooth speakers, suddenly the whole guitar disappears. So this is something that, that often happens and is quite tragic when it does. So I'm glad that you avoided that by simply recording the same track twice. I, I have done that. Yeah, no. everybody has. Everybody has, at least once. Yeah. Some people only notice after mastering, which is a true story. Um, I won't mention any names. All right. Um, and what's the fun? The next track is yeah. Next uh, track is lo-fi. Yeah, lo-fi, yeah. So I used the lo-fi, and I believe I used maybe there's an amp on this one. I dragged in from yeah. I think it was the nice. Fender-esque amp, so the sort of the black panel. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, looks right. like kind of a deluxe reverb with the vibrato on there, and I also added some uh, fe some pedals as well. Sweet. So which is nice and easy to bring in. Take a um, listen. So oh, cool. A nice tremolo. That's very lush. I mean, especially when you hear it together with the ambient track, it really works. It yeah, adds so a bit nice, of movement. Nice bed. Love it. Kind of. And I did that, I believe I did what I shouldn't have done there and uh, duplicated the tracks <laughs> uh, and panned one each uh, Sometimes side. you can get away with it. Yeah, I think it sounds okay. I, I put different effects on each one, I believe, so... Ah, that's great. Yeah, then, then it can certainly work. I think there's a phaser on one of them. Uh, I think they both have a flanger, but uh, it should be fine. Uh, if you want to check, you can always click here and play back in mono. Yeah, I don't see any issues. No, I, believe, I think I used the actual the phaser yeah. plug-in. Plug oh, I only yeah, see the flanger I think, I here. think so, flanger, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think it's on both, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think it's so it looks like thing. I have duplicated that. So it's like, a, it's like a mono, just twice as loud. But that one I used the lo-fi setting on the uh, Acoustasonic. Again, nice. it's all, bit, all the Acoustasonic, so just to show how versatile that guitar is. Mm. Absolutely, at the end of it, come and have a go if you want to have, try them at the end of the session. Um, and then the next track was, it says Clean Telly. So I yes. used the... Um, which engages the noiseless pickup, as you can see there. Um, the pickups are all Tim Shaw designed. I don't know if you guys have heard of Tim Shaw, but he is our absolute pickup genius at Fender. He's done so much stuff for us. It's, he's kind of a legend in the industry. And he worked with Fishman uh, to get these developed. Um, the one on the Jazzmaster you see there is called the Shawbucker. So a Shawbucker is named after Tim Shaw, and you'll see those Shawbuckers on lots of different guitars. He's an absolute legend and one of the nicest people in the whole world. So, um, yeah, so we used, I used the clean telly for that one. I don't know what it's so, doing. I can't... It would also be nice to hear that without the insert effects. So let me just disable them. This is what it sounds dry. Also, very nice sound. And with the effects that you added, it sounds like this. Just like an empire. I think there's a chorus on there, yeah. Yeah. I love I love this chorus pedal on there. It's based, yeah. obviously based on the. If I turn it off, then you can really hear the difference. Um, so this is without. This is with. This is nice vibrato. You can actually adjust the speed with this little dial here. That really adds something. Yeah, I really like it. It's obviously based on a very famous pedal. Yeah. Uh, I won't say which who, who, that, who, that, who that's by. But, yeah, with um, an R. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and also put an e equalizer on it as well, because often with, uh, from experience of doing the recording, being the guy doing the playing, um, you can never roll enough bottom end off a guitar. So True. you really kind of want to put the top end on a guitar. Um, mm -hmm. if, if, by the way, if anyone is... Not understanding me, just please say and I'll slow down. 
And then you have a mixed verb, which yeah. is essentially creating this this big reverb effect here. And a compressor to glue it all together. Again, you just drag it all in. There's yep. loads of presets. So I, I think I chose a preset that probably said electric guitar pick yep. or something like that. Right. So it was so easy to do. That's an excellent point, actually. So if you don't want to do this from scratch, then you can always go to the so-called effects chains in the browser. And you simply select the instrument that you want to have and that you want to process. Uh, uh, for example, here I'm in the guitar folder. And I could go for Sordo negative, which gives me like a type O negative kind of guitar if I look for that. And um, I could drag that into a track and it would add like an entire, entire uh, chain of plugins um, that give me the processing. Also for vocals, for example, this can be very useful. Uh, so for example, if I go to vocals, let's say I want to have processing for a backing vocal. I can just drag that in and you see there's already a compressor and equalizer setting for the backing vocal. So I don't have to know these things. I can just drag the thing that I'm looking for directly from the browser. And of course, this also comes with a search function. So uh, if I search something for like female vocals, I could just type in female or something like that. And it gives me like the female vocal preset right here that I can drag in, right? And uh, this would be a channel, channel strip in this case. So um, the search is definitely our friend. And um, like Jamie has said, we can simply drag and drop all of these effects directly onto the tracks, and we can create the tracks by dragging and dropping them. We're, basically, all we're doing all the time is dragging things from the browser into our timeline. That's basically all we're doing to create uh, everything that you're seeing here. And then we have the grunge, right? The grunge. grunge. So this was using the Acoustasonic on the telly pickup with the added kind of grit. Mm. Uh, and I used the um, what's essentially a Vox AC30 there. That's a nice bit of crunch. Yeah, to it. yeah. it's got that real chimey Vox classic Vox sound. Mm -hmm. Also because you have like a pretty strong yeah or Vox S. It's not yeah. a Vox, but you know. Yeah, it's a nice low cut also yeah. to just uh, enhance that. Very cool. And how do you how do you um, dial these in? Is it just by feel, or do you also consider what you've already recorded or what you've already mixed? Um, yeah, I kind of I think in this case I probably would take some things out, and if I had more time and uh, to do this, and now I'm sort of getting into the software, learning how to do mm -hmm. it, yeah. I would probably, there'd be a lot of volume fades and things like yeah, that. Yeah, right? yeah, Because at the moment, it's just, everything is there. So, uh, but yeah, it's just listening, really. It's right, kind of... right. Yeah, and you can see, by the way, he. I don't think you've automated anything in this. I haven't song. automated anything, right? because at the time, I hadn't got that far. So I thought right. this might be an opportunity for... To and show it how still to... sounds great, right? Yeah. So you do not need automation per se, uh, to, to create a finished song. Uh, automation is just one of the tools that you have available to make your life a bit easier. Like often you find that you, uh, you know, you, you dial like the reverb amount up and down with your mouse and you like that effect, but you kind of want to free up your mouse to do other stuff. <laughs> and then you need like some kind of automation that does that for you. So your, your mouse, your peripheral device is freed up again. And that's all that automation is, but you do not necessarily need that to create and write a full finished song, right? So uh, often people think they have to study this stuff to really uh, uh, fin finalize an idea and, and release it, but that's just not true. You can, you can write some of the greatest songs ever with the most basic functionalities in these softwares. Right. Okay, and then we have uh, just a few more tracks. You have the high riff and yeah. the riff. Okay. Oh, interesting. So these are like in the higher register. Yeah, just a different frequency. To and this gives a lot of beef. Right. And I love that you went like 
with a left, right, and center yeah. to really create a wide stereo field yeah. with these. I just kind of experimented really in what I like the sound of. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe on the the heavy electric guitar, the sort of there is a there's a few pedals on there as well. I think there's a tube screamer and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So literally everything you need is in there to be able to to make music. Awesome. Is there any other tracks that you want to point out specifically? Uh, so there, um, I did put a, so as I said, I hooked up a MIDI keyboard, oh, yeah. um, which I'd never done before. <laughs> Just plugged it in and it automatically directed me kind of from instructions of what to do. Um, so the first one I have, I believe, is a Selena, yeah. which is, was part of the strings uh, package in Studio One. Uh, and Selena is one of my favorite instruments. It's just a high, it's kind of, it was the, the evolution of the Mellotron. It was kind of the next thing that came along. Mm -hmm. A real 70s sounding kind of string. Lovely. Um, and that was, yeah, nice and simple. Mm -hmm. uh, and then drums. I, um, there was a ton of, of drum loops available to me in Studio One. Mm -hmm. So I just put some together. I put, if I had more time, I probably would have had a few, few more bits. Mm -hmm. But it was kind of just to keep the rhythm and kind of... So I, I chose a few different loops and just dragged them in. Right, so the way you probably did that is you have all of these sound sets yep. available inside of Studio One. This is just content, like sample library content that comes with Studio One. And you can literally just audition these sounds. And if there's anything that you like, you can just, again, drag that into your session. And... Um, you can have that directly quantized meaning in the same tempo and rhythm as all of the other things in your project by having time stretch engaged on the track. So when time stretch is engaged, then no matter what the original tempo of this is, it will be matched with the project tempo of 115. So even if this was played like twice as fast, it would still slow it down to 115 to match. and. Uh, it's actually astonishing the quality of this, um, how, how well this works. Like I, I've been able to slow things down by like 35 BPM or something like that and it still sounded almost as good as the original piece, which is of course great because then you can really combine all kinds of rhythms with your piece no matter what the original tempo is. So that's basically what, you, what you've done yeah, here, just, right? Just taken different loops and put them in. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is a good moment just uh, to very briefly mention that you do not have to use audio like loops and drums that are ready to go. Uh, you can also use these individual sounds that create your own beats. For example, if I was in a completely new song, and let's say I have this audio loop here, but I want to... Um, play my own rhythm with it, right? I don't want to use that rhythm it came with. I want to program something myself. Then what I can do is I can just load in one of these samplers. This might look very familiar to hip hop producers. This is, you know, this classic MPC interface. And what I do is I just take this sample here from the browser and I just drag that in. And when I hold down shift, it's going to slice it up across the pads. So now, with a MIDI controller, I can actually play my own rhythm with it, right? So I do not have to use the uh, rhythm it comes with. I can just use the sounds that it comes with and create my own rhythmic pattern from there. And um, of course, that is also incredibly easy to do. It's easy to quantize that as yeah, well. Yeah, we even have like a step sequencer here. That would be. Right? And you could already create something that's entirely your own from, from a sample. And nobody could tell that this was actually coming from uh, one of these factory libraries. Right? Nobody, no one would be able to tell. So that's just something that I wanted to, to uh, mention because you use these audio loops, which is, of course, absolutely valid and totally possible, but you do not have to use them if you don't want to.
I think moving forward, I would definitely use the, the, your, this option. Yeah, it's like it's the, the best of both worlds, yeah. right? Because you, you still get the amazing, pristine sound of these top quality samples, but you do not have to play in the same style, yeah. you know? So that's, that's really what I like about it. All right, great. And then you have a piano here as well. Right? This is, a, I, I've named it a piano, but I think it, this is a modular synthesizer. Oh, yeah. And it was just to add a bed, so. Let's see. Oh yeah, there's no piano, sure. Interesting, I would love to hear that in context. So if I just uh, enable the... Oh, that's lovely. Like just these tracks together. I think this is a great example why many producers and mix engineers say that you shouldn't mix everything in solo. Because when you, when you hear this by itself, you might be inclined to throw it out, right? Because it doesn't do anything. But when you hear it in context with the other instruments, you understand how important it is to add some movement. And that's why you shouldn't make these kind of mixing decisions uh, when everything is soloed. Always hear it in context. Right? It was a really great synth in there as well. It was mm. really easy to use. Kind of reminded me of an old kind of the old Moog-esque. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, and if you want to add that to your session again, I always show you the same thing in different variations. Right? It's just drag it into your song. Like this. Whoop. It's really that simple. And I think the last thing I did was add a Wurlitzer. Oh yeah, nice, nice. Which is badly Ooh. played by myself, sorry. I have a weakness or these well it's the kind of sounds. Awesome. And how long how long did it take you to make all this? For about four to five hours, I think I spent on this. Impressive. But I, I probably could have spent a lot longer. I was really <laughs> but uh, my children and everything. Yeah, the, the life got in the way and I've <laughs> So, but moving forward, I'm going to, yeah, this is going to be, I'm going to go really delve into this. Oh, that's it's really, really exciting, impressive. Yeah, Four yeah. to five hours, including like children trying <laughs> yeah, to distract yeah. you. Chapeau. That's, that's pretty impressive. All right. Yeah, maybe one more thing that I would like to show you guys. I mean, there's so many things that I could show you about the software, and I also want to leave room for some of your questions. But a function that I always loved is what I call voice note to MIDI. So because I'm not a great instrumentalist, I don't play keyboard very well, and I don't play guitar very well, and I also don't want to click my melodies in with a mouse, I felt like I have no device to, to write in the software, right? Because what's in my head, I just cannot translate it one-to-one. -one. And that was frustrating because I was already able to hum my melody. I could, I could do it with my voice, right? I just couldn't get the notes on paper. And then I discovered that in this software, you can actually transform the notes that you're singing with your voice into MIDI notes that can be played by any instrument you can imagine. So for example, here I have a voice memo. I was literally just humming that to myself the other day. Da, 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 da. Right, I just took out my iPhone da, 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 and I <laughs> airdropped that onto my MacBook, which seems ridiculous. But what I can do in the software is I can analyze these notes with Melodyne. Uh, this is simply just hitting Command and M. All I do is Command and M on a Mac would be Control and M on Windows. You don't need to worry about that shortcut. But this allows me to now drag these audio waveform events onto a MIDI track. And those are the notes. That's what I just sung with my voice. And now, that can be played by any other instrument that I want. For example, a synthesizer. Right? So this, is, this means I don't have to play keyboard well or guitar well in order to get my, my notes into my composition. I could also use a guitar, you know, play something and convert that into MIDI notes and have that 
be played by a synthesizer, a piano, or whatever instrument you can imagine. Right? So we're not tied to these keyboard interfaces. We can use them if that's what we prefer, but we don't have to. And that's really what I liked about this software, that is so, so versatile. Um, you can transform audio into MIDI. You can create MIDI back into audio. It's, it's not like so strictly separated from each other and really allows for some creative workflows like, like this, for example. And um, yeah, um, I think that's, I mean, I mean, I could show you so many things. Like for example here, this is another thing that I really like. This is just a regular drum beat. And let's say on this snare, I want to have a reverb, but just on that snare, not on all the other stuff. Sounds pretty simple, right? But how, how would you do that in, in, in other softwares? It's actually quite challenging. You would have to add like an automation that turns off or on the effect at that particular point, and uh, it would be like a whole thing. But in Studio One, you can just go to the reverb that you want. Like let's say I want to have a reverb on this snare, right? So it could be, for example, this one here. And I, again, drag and drop that onto the track. But before I let go, I hold down Alt on my keyboard instead. And then you can see that it would actually put the reverb just on the snare. Can you see that? And when we listen to that, it sounds like this. Right? Or if I want to have like a delay or something like that, just on, on this one then I could just do that again with a different plugin. Like for example, beat delay, hold alt. Now I have like this fairly complex thing, you know, like two plugins that are just working on two of the segments of this recording, but it, I literally just drag and drop that from, from the browser. I created something quite complex uh, without doing any automation for it. So this seemingly easy concept of just dragging stuff onto each other or into the browser or into the timeline actually actually is quite deep. And um, yeah, the deeper you go, the more creative you get. I find. But of course, you don't have to you don't have to dive in this far. Like all of the things that we showed you, like in the very beginning, are enough more than enough to create your own album, your own EP. And uh, only if you want to really get into the weeds, then it's open-ended. But you don't have to. OK, yeah, any questions from you guys? Yeah, I mean, uh, if you're asking for like stem separation, not yet. <laughs> but uh, with a big yet. Uh, like, uh, but you can, you can definitely uh, uh, slice it up by, by uh, section already. And uh, if you have like an isolated section where just the bass is playing or just the drums is playing, it's already possible today. But you can, in the future, certainly also separate them completely from each other, like remove the vocals and things like that. Uh, which reminds me, I'm glad you're, you're bringing this up. Um, I really want to show you how you can export uh, the whole song once it's finished, right? So for example, this is your song, uh, Jamie, I'm not sure. Have you actually ex exported this as an MP3 or WAV file yet? OK, so that's really easy to do. Let's say I have my song done, and I now want to share that with my friends. I want to upload that to SoundCloud, to Spotify, uh, Apple Music, or whatever. All I need to do is just draw in the export range. I can do that by uh, you know, holding my mouse here to the timeline, and I can just uh, you know, adjust the range like this. It's very simple. Uh, kind of like it would work in like a video editing software or something like that, like uh, Premiere or DaVinci Resolve would be the same. And once that is set, once the entire content of our song is highlighted, then we can go up here to where it says Song and Export Mixdown. And I want to make sure that we're exporting the loop range because that's, that's what I set here, this is the loop range. And now I can just uh, decide the kind of files that I want to export. So I could make like a WAV, an MP3, or both at once. You can also set the sample rate. Now when it comes to bit rate, that's quite important. Uh, for MP3, don't set that to 64, because it's going to sound really bad if you set 
uh, your MP3 to 64 kilobits. It's just a very small file that you're generating. It's smaller than like a WhatsApp voice memo or something like that, so really bad quality. Um, please make sure there's at least 256 or 320. And then uh, you can actually also adjust the loudness automatically if you want to match it to a certain loudness target of uh, YouTube or Spotify or something like that. We even have presets for that, actually. So that's uh, also handled automatically. And then, yeah, you just literally uh, specify the path. It can be any path that you want. And then you go down here to hit OK. And it's going to create an MP3 away file. That's, that's really all there is to it. You could even upload directly to SoundCloud from, uh, from Studio One. That's also possible. Uh, on the interface. Uh, on this one, not, but we have the uh, Quantum HD interfaces, for example. And there you have uh, both SPDIF as well as ADAT. And you can actually go up to 26 inputs and 30 outputs with that, which is quite a lot. Yeah. So, But this is like a very small on-the-go interface. So there we don't have SPDIF. Yeah. yeah, this software actually works great, even on uh, work laptops or laptops that are not specifically designed for... Uh, audio editing and things like that. And there's a few reasons for this. For example, we have this feature called Plugin Nap. And what Plugin Nap does is it basically shuts off any plugins that are currently not being used. Right? So um, you can see now this, this moon icon appeared anywhere on, on pretty much all of the tracks. And that indicates that there's currently no input on this track. Like there's no audio happening. So this plugin can be turned off. And this is actually quite important because the more plugins you shut off this way, the more you reduce the CPU load. Like when I disable plugin app, like now I have like almost 8% more load. And this is important because when you, when you think about a song like this, you might have 17 or 18 tracks, but rarely they all play at once. That almost never happens, right? Maybe seven or eight or nine play at once, but not 17 or 18. So the plugins that are on the remaining tracks could just be shut off. And that's what we do in the background. You do not have to worry about that. So, so we have a few of these optimizations happening in the background that make Studio One more efficient than other music softwares. Another thing that we do is we have two separate latencies in the software. So latency is basically the delay between what you're playing and what travels into your computer through all of your effects and out to your speakers. And you want to have that delay as short as possible, right? You want to play your guitar and you want to go into your amp simulation and out, and there should be no audible delay. But the shorter that delay should be, the harder your CPU has to work to make that happen, right? It's like, um, uh, think somebody throws like a couple of mathematical equations at you and you have like 20 minutes to solve them, then you can Google, Google the solutions, you're fine, right? But if they suddenly say like you have two seconds, then suddenly it gets uh, super hard and you start uh, dropping a lot of uh, things. And that's exactly what happens here. Um, but in our case, we have two different latencies. So we have the latency for your actual recording, which you only do on one or two tracks, right? So you can set that here and set that as low as possible. And then for all the other tracks that are not being played in real time, that are just playback, you can set a different latency here. So for example, I can have 2,048 samples, which is a ton for all the tracks that are not being monitored in real time, while still having 64 samples for what I play in real time. So this would still allow you to play an instrument like the guitar without any delay, without crashing the CPU, you know, or completely overloading it. And we have many of these little uh, uh, nifty performance optimizations inside of our software to ensure that it doesn't just run up the, on the you know, most optimized machines out there, but also on other machines that are designed to do other things. I use my work computer to do yeah. this. Yeah. yeah. This one here. <laughs> I, I wrote most of my productions on like a 13-inch Ultrabook that was not designed for audio at all. Yeah, you can also use Melodyne for that, actually. So. For example, um, let's say I have a file and I don't know the original BPM, right? I just drag this in and I don't know the BPM. Then I can, again, open Melodyne. 
And it would tell me the tempo uh, right here, usually. Uh, let's see. Right. In this case, it doesn't work, but usually it would say the uh, actual BPM in brackets right here. So this is what I usually use to, um, you know, detect the tempo of any file. Oh, in this case, Studio One has actually detected it by itself. It thinks it's 78, which is actually correct, but it's currently in red because it's not sure. And then you can say, yeah, I approve. That's actually the correct tempo. So in this case, I didn't even have to ask Melodyne. Studio One did it by itself. But if Studio One doesn't know, then Melodyne does most of the time. One of them always knows. Yeah. Right. And uh, once you have the original tempo, then you can stretch it with much higher quality, right? Because um, time stretching only works when you know the original tempo and you know the target tempo. Otherwise, you can't really calculate something well, right? It's like not knowing one of the one of the parts of the equation. Um, but as soon as you know the file tempo like this, you could make it twice as fast or half as, half as fast, and it would still be uh, yeah, pretty much lossless in terms of quality. Yeah. So the time stretching in Studio One is really quite remarkable. For example, this is the original tempo, but I could make that much faster. And you don't really hear any quality loss, so I could make it much, sm much slower. And you can actually go pretty far with that. And um, I know people who use Studio One for just for time stretching, you know, to prepare the stems for their remix. Like if they want to create like a half tempo version of the original, they would import the stems into Studio One, make them half as slow, and then go further into the oh. software they actually want to use. That. Yeah. Yeah, you can you can absolutely install all of the uh, sound set and sample library content on an external drive. Yes, actually, I use Dropbox for this in my case. Yeah. So here inside of Studio One Preferences under Locations, you see that my my uh, my path for all of my songs and presets is actually Dropbox. So that way, all of my computers are in sync. Yeah, I, I do not have to worry about it. And uh, my Dropbox on my work computer is actually on an external drive, uh, but they still reference the same the same path. So that's pretty cool. Thank you very much for having Thank us, guys. Thank you so guys. much. It was great uh, to be here. We really loved it. And, um, and if you want to, as I said, want to try any of the Acoustasonics or ask any questions to us, please yeah. come and give us a shout.